Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And uh, we're glad you're with us today. We're going to do a, kind of a little bit different show today. I think it's going to be kind of fun. And it was inspired by the fact that I'm trying to design a house. And I haven't done that since I was like in college trying to do architecture. And of course, all the building codes have changed and a bunch of other stuff has changed. But so is the technology. And, you know, as I work in my regular day job about trying to do microgrids and vehicles that are all new technology, I start to think, you know, well, how do we take a hundred year old grid and houses that are wired and have been set up for the last 50 or 60 years with an electrical system that's not changed a whole lot other than having grounded outlets and, and GFI units and, and stuff in your kitchens and bathroom. What are some of the new technologies and new ways that we could look at wiring a house that would maybe be much more efficient? Uh, much more redundant, you know, where if one system failed, you still have another system to back you up. Um, and maybe even less expensive because you'd use smaller wires instead of big 14 or 12 gauge wires to run your AC power. So we're going to talk about that today with my favorite electrical engineer from Burns and McDonald, uh, Ryan Womans. And uh, thanks for being here again today, Ryan. Yeah, Appreciate thanks, it. Dan. And um, so we talk a little bit about this while we're, you know, off the air. And it's like, you know, what are some of the things that we could do? I mean, I talked a little bit about maybe, let's, talk, let's start at the top and work our way down. Mm -hmm. We've got solar on the roof, and it's providing a bunch of DC electric power for our off-the-grid house. We have an off-the-grid house, and that solar is uh, being collected and used, put through inverters to provide AC power to the house, which is what most houses are wired for today and then battery storage to make sure that when the solar is not running, when it's nighttime or whatever, you got stored up energy to put through those inverters and go into the AC system. So at the top of the house, we have solar. And it's DC by design, right? It's, yep. it's DC power. So we have these new LED lights, that, like the ones in the studio here, really bright, uh, really efficient, use hardly any electricity compared to incandescent lights, no heat, you know, a lot of really get very little heat, got a lot of great characteristics, and they could be 12 volt. How could we start at the, that lighting level and set up maybe just the lighting system to be DC instead of AC? Would, would that be mm -hmm. reasonable or feasible, or what would be some of the advantages of doing that? Yeah, so reasonable and Feasible, yes, and yes. Technically possible, yes. Uh, okay. So we get yeses all across the board. Um, we run into a little bit of an issue, and, and we'll just write that off for the rest of the show, which is the, some codes and standards that re will require you to do certain things in certain situations. Okay. Because some of the, sometimes codes and standards, while they are all very safe and, and they're great, and we're going to build by that as far as just talking, um, we can have a safe conversation about how to how to how to do something, but it might not get a, a permit because it's a different way of doing okay. it. And then uh, let's think uh, we, we're an off-grid house. Yep. Is that where we're no, at? No, we're off-grid house. Okay. So a few things I, I start to think about right away is I, I consider energy, uh, we are 100% renewable off-the-grid house. We can start to consider our energy as a bit of a scarce resource, or at least a limited resource, uh, anything we're pre um, generating on-site and storing on-site. Mm -hmm. So. When we have all those variables set, we start to look at lighting. Um, right now, if we're LED or, or sitting underneath LED fixtures, they are likely they're, they're a, a DC LED. Um, mm -hmm. But they're all powered off of AC off the normal panel board. So, so, so what we're doing so now with our LED lights, for the most part, at least in houses, is we're taking solar DC power, mm -hmm. running it through an inverter that turns into AC power, yep to put it in your house to run the AC power to a light that's DC power and convert it back to and DC. Go right back to DC. So do we have efficiency losses there in heat and transmission and things like that? There is. There is. There is there is an efficiency loss going from DC to AC. It's also another component we have to pay for. It's also another component that can fail. Okay. So um, all, when we stack all of those, can we get rid of them? You know, we had DC, uh, as you say, from the solar and the battery. We're, we're consuming DC on the LED. Yeah. We could get rid of the middle components mm -hmm. and, and produce and store our DC energy and then consume directly on the DC level. So yeah, it is technically doable and cheaper even uh, to buy the correct LED 
light fixture to, mm -hmm. to the voltage that we are storing it at. And then our cable size, because the LED is such a small amperage, small amperage yeah. um, even at these lower voltages, they, it is still a relatively low current. Mm -hmm. Um, we can put in smaller cables. Now, that's where we're going to talk codes and standards. Remember, we mm -hmm. threw those out the yep. windows a little bit ago. So, yeah, we, I can technically install a smaller cable for a smaller load and, and have it be safe. And, and all of that would amount to being a less cost on mm -hmm. our off-the-grid house. And as a trend, copper is getting more and more expensive rather than cheaper and cheaper, as evidenced by the people that steal copper out of our utility company lines, things like that. But yep. Um, so let's just say right now in, the, in a standard house as it's built right now to code, you come in and maybe have a 15 amp circuit that's going to lighting to mm -hmm. several rooms yep. and the wire is a 14 gauge wire and it's set up so that the neutral line is all synced out but the, the, the hot line is interrupted by the switch. The switch is, is the one that interrupts the hot, hot line yep. to be to code. So you've got a at least a 14 gauge line of hot power going to your switch and then a neutral line you know going on to your light and a and the, the hot line coming back to the switch is all 14 gauge and that could be 15 20 feet of 14 gauge wire for every light going back to every switch yeah when that could be something even a small as speaker wire or, i mean pretty yeah. small yeah like, even smaller yeah like what you have on your computer speakers Little little thin wires, yeah, saving probably probably a, a fourth a fourth maybe of the copper that's in those other wires. We are definitely saving a magnitude of yeah. of cost, and not just on the the material, but the installation itself. It's it's easier to install, and there's less risk installing lower voltages systems. Mm -hmm. So so for hypothetical, not including the code, yeah, we have solar on the roof. Maybe a bank of 12 volt batteries that are set up to stay as a 12 volt system. Sure. It goes right to your lights and only your lights. That's all they do. We can do that. Okay. Pretty simple. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Hard to wire. No. Pretty simple. Let's do it. Okay. So now let's move ourselves down another step to some of your bigger appliances and stuff that maybe aren't well suited from, from 12 volt DC. Although at this point I want to inject that your car is 12 volt DC. Your mm -hmm. speedboat is 12 volt DC. Your RV is probably 12 volt DC, maybe also propane or something. But you're basically have a whole lot of choices, even with some small appliances, in the 12 volt DC range. So let's say with your laptop computer, which you are also kind of like the LED, have a DC system and a DC battery, and you're plugging it into an AC unit with an inverter to make it back to DC. Mm -hmm. And that's losing efficiency again. What if we had USB ports, like at chest height, where our AC power is down low and our USB ports are up at desk height or a little higher, maybe above the fire break in the wall. Okay. And so it's separated for code that we're going to create after we finish this we're discussion. Gonna yeah, yeah, we're going to make our own code. Okay. Um, and now you have USB ports instead of outlets in every room, maybe a couple in every room. So the, when you're in there, you can charge or run on, you're on your cell phone. You can plug in your computer with a USB plug instead of converting to AC and back to DC again. Is that feasible? Yeah, it, it's feasible. Um, if we want to stay on your mantra that we're, we're going to try and stay on, on one volt, voltage level, our lights are on, we decided a 12 volt system, um, or maybe we switch because our USB is actually typically a five volt. System. Oh, okay. So they're, they're a little bit different, a little bit off. Um, that's the USB standard if we're playing by those rules. We could, if you want to stay on your 12-volt system, put the, the car charging port around okay. your house, and we could plug in because that's something that's, that has been a standardized uh, component. But, um, yeah, let's just switch it to USB. Let's go upstairs to our lights, switch that to 5 volts. Okay. Now we've got a 5-volt system. 5-volt okay. light it can, can produce a lot of light. Uh, we, can, we can plug a, a power light off of uh, an Ethernet cable. Okay, so this is a kind of a sidebar that we didn't talk about. But you brought in the car mm -hmm. uh, and, and plug in your car charger. Well, what if you could take your electric vehicle now and plug it in to charge your 12-volt or 5-volt system? Because it'd need an inverter or something in there too. But that then augments your batteries and your solar already in that system. So, for example, yeah. your solar is not working because the sun's been you know, under a cloud for two weeks and it's been raining, mm -hmm. you could actually take your car and pretty easily convert 
some 12 volt energy coming out of your car into running your house, assuming you have a robust enough battery system in your car to not drain it down to nothing. But um, for a short term, yeah. like, like for one evening or something, you get through a minor power outage, that feasible? Yeah, you could do that with your, with my Jeep right now. I could go plug it in and wire it up and make it work. If mm -hmm. you have um, a larger electric vehicle, you yeah. got a lot of power there and definitely a different voltage and different system going on um, in there and uh, likely a lot of DC as well. So then we would have another conversion, but yeah, everybody's car that you have right now. Okay. Um, we, could, we could suck some 12 volt off of that okay. and, and repower our system if um, maybe our solar broke or um, uh, it's been cloudy for too long or we really want to use a lot of energy, then yeah, okay. plug, in our, plug in our cars. You know I'm really holding back on a fuel cell here, too, with hydrogen, so we won't even talk about that. I'll, right. I'll push that off the uh, table. Just let's, the, do, let's add that to next time. We'll do, that to the, we'll, we'll do the same thing with the codes and stuff. We'll push the hydrogen off on the okay. side for now. Okay, so we have a, a DC system. Could be 5 volt, could be 12 volt, running everything above the waist in your house, lights, USB ports, mm -hmm. um, and it's a separate system. But charging that system and also charging another battery system, maybe a 48 volt battery system, is the solar. So we have a more robust 48-volt um, battery system that now is going through inverters and giving you your AC power that you need for motors, refrigerator motors, compressors, um, your TV. Can the TV be uh, DC also? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it probably already mm -hmm. is, actually. Yeah. Well, it's that might go the USB port now. It's, it definitely is DC right now. Yeah. Okay. So even your TV could be 4-volt DC or 5-volt DC, yeah. somewhere there. But your bigger appliances that have heavier motors and stuff, generally AC is a little bit better for that because you've got a little bit more robust um, uh, amperage capability getting through that wire um, to run AC systems. Is that a, a good analogy? Not. In general, it can be. Okay. So DC motors and AC motors both have very um, strong attributes to either side that make them good for different applications. Okay. When we start talking appliances, AC wins because you're going to plug it into a wall. That's why it wins. Whether it's not, it's the right motor for the right application uh -huh. would be up for a mechanical engineer to help debate. Okay. But the DC motors, and especially at this scale, are very, very capable. Okay. So, no, you wouldn't have to switch over to AC for to drive a, a compressor uh, for refrigeration or for uh, maybe a washer dryer or something like that. Okay. You could. You could keep it DC, but we need to then go back to the manufacturing world and say, you know, why, why aren't right. we building these with DC? Because I, I really want to do it on my, my one house right. that I've got, and I want a, a DC refrigerator. Okay. And, and you can have a DC refrigerator. So, so I was under the impression that there was a, an advantage to AC when you had, like, heavy draw or, or big, big Russian loads, you know, from equipment that has motors and things like that. But DC can handle it. Yeah. So... Really, we could make the entire house DC as one option. We're, we're kind of creating the, the never-been-made-before house, so we have options now. Yeah. And, and trying to figure out what would be good for the world if we, if we rearranged all houses or most houses, single-family houses off the grid to be this way. They could be completely DC. Yeah, no, absolutely. We could, we could have a DC house multiplied by a couple billion and, and have a lot of DC houses. Um, well, we'll shave some efficiencies by, by not converting. We do have different voltages, so we do have uh, some conversion going on okay. there. But depending on how you're setting up your system, and now we're talking 2 billion of these, so we can get really efficient. Uh, if you had a 48-volt system, you actually have four 12-volt systems right. uh -huh. already in there. So we, as long as you're pulling from the right battery and keeping them all uh, leveled off, mm -hmm. about the same, uh, that, that's what's going to help you out. So okay. it's... Very possible, and I think at this point we got rid of the AC system. I don't even think we were intending to, but um, I can't think of a lot of loads that could not be handled by uh, DC. It, okay. We'll get into some scaling issues, but very, very possible. Okay. So, so we may, if we were going to be off the grid, if we had the choice of appliances, it's probably a better way to approach this. Um, if we had a reasonably, reasonably priced refrigerator unit, Mm-hmm. Um, that you could buy without spending six thousand dollars for a single, because it's the, only one company makes DC refrigerators. Yep. You know, but we got them economy of scale, manufacturing and stuff, and it came down to the same price as AC, or maybe even a little cheaper than AC because they're using less wires or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, 
We could do a whole house on 48 volt DC. Is that yeah. reasonable? Yeah, we could do a whole house. The refrigerator won't be a cheaper DC component. It won't have less copper. Okay. We do need to have a certain amount of energy dissipated and converted. Okay. That energy will be in the form of, let's say, watts, whether it's a, a DC um, watt or, okay. or VA okay. or AC. We still need energy to be confirmed. Okay. Transformed. So the, the amount of copper is w within our appliances will, will be the same. Okay. Amount, the amount well, of energy in the appliance. We'll talk, we'll, we'll come back to this after a break and talk a little bit about what's already available for RVs, boats, and cars in, in DC power mm -hmm. that could easily fill that bill in an RV yeah. or in a house. Okay, we'll be back in 60 seconds to talk about that. Aloha, I'm Yukari Kunisue, the host of Konnichiwa Hawaii. Japanese talk show on ThinkTech Hawaii. Konnichiwa Hawaii is all Japanese broadcast show and is streamed live on ThinkTech at 2 p.m. every other Monday. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on ThinkTech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests, I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man here on an Energy Friday that we have just amped up a few more kilowatts or at least a bunch of amps anyway. And uh, we're talking about how to change our house to a newer system that hopefully is more efficient and um, less expensive to install and maybe operate and maybe even simpler and safer for that matter um, using technology we already have. But... We're throwing out the code piece. We're, we're saying none of this would work to code right now because it hasn't been written. But it's notional. We, we could think about these things and maybe look to the future and develop national um, fire protection code and international building code that accommodates these things. So that's why we're talking about it. But I got Ryan Wilbins here from Burns and McDonald. And we're talking about maybe making our house. Uh, we started talking about appliances. We, we also have a lot of people have on the mainland, not so much here in Hawaii, uh, recreational vehicles that are also mostly DC and sometimes propane. I think people would be surprised if they understood that in RVs and other things, the refrigerator is propane. Mm -hmm. The heating and cooling is propane. There's water heaters that run off propane. There's, it's like, there's a lot of things that can be done with propane as a um, refrigerant slash energy source in a system that are really efficient. I rented an RV in Alaska a couple of years, well, about 10 years ago. And on an eight-day trip, I used $5 worth of propane. And that ran my stove, my air conditioning, and my refrigerator. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. So we, we can even look at natural gases, um, even though they're carbon-based still. The U.S. mainland has a lot of that. They might want to even think about that for a while yeah. until we get completely green. Yep. Um, but but to help us get our, our economy, our efficiency down, switching to LEDs, going with DC systems, and maybe going to natural gas for some of these. Mm -hmm. But let's push the natural gas with the hydrogen for now, and the, and the USB and the, uh, the okay. I, IBS, and, and just talk about DC systems. So you start with refrigerators. You're pretty confident we could have a, a double door um, Sub-zero refrigerator and freezer system that could yeah. be DC. Yeah, no, we actually, we, we definitely can. Um, from the electrical side, uh, there's not an issue to drive the mechanical components for refrigeration. A uh, refrigerator, a freezer, those are some of the big appliances that you got in your house. Uh, when you look at an oven or a stove, if you're still rocking the electrical range, there's no motors in there other than maybe a fan it for, pulls a lot of power. for some convection. That guy's pulling a lot of power. Yeah. Electrical directly to heat is not um, very favorable from the electrical consumption. From an yeah. energy use, the conversion's not 
great. Um, maybe then we'll we'll pull back your other resource. But okay. uh, then we got what we got a washer and dryer is a pretty, yeah, pretty wash good machine. size load. Yeah, yeah. I mean TVs. Boats already have them too. You know, washers and dryers. Yeah. Um, TVs are a DC yeah. device. They, they've got their own inverter. Which brings up an interesting point. When we start converting our sensitive electronics, our computers, um, some TVs, um, if we're going to just plug our phone directly in, there is a level of power quality that needs to had, uh, be had and, and, and given to these devices. And it can be uh, strict. So um, the, the system, if we're going to just convert and start plugging in all of our electronics and take our TVs and say, get rid of uh, your, your inverters, I'm, I'm going to give you everything you need. There will be a uh, very strict level of power quality that we need to place on our system. Mm -hmm. But we're only going to do it once. We're going to give it to everything. Mm -hmm. We're not going to make every device try and handle their power quality is, on their own. Is that, in, in a lot of cases, focused on the battery and the battery management system and how the batteries work? Yeah, it'll be on the battery management system, <coughs> but... Um, when you turn a uh, device on, when we when our refrigerator turns on, it'll take a power draw. It pulls a bunch of power, and and that will drive our voltage down briefly mm -hmm. until we can reestablish. Um, we need a system that doesn't drop voltage; that it's actually holding the power. So, down. like a built-in surge protector we have on a lot of our computers right now. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's okay. like a surge protector to prevent the the high end rush. But if it were to drop. You need to compensate for that drop okay. and make sure that you're not failing any components. Okay. The sensitive devices, they, 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 they need a uh, nice clean power signal to, to okay. operate. Okay, so it's uh, at least theoretically possible that we can convert all the way to DC for everything. Virtually everything except maybe an electric range or an electric dryer or an electric water heater. Those three I would think would be kind of more on the Hey, let's go with natural gas on those or maybe burn hydrogen or something if you want to be clean instead of natural gas. Yeah. Then we could do that. Yeah, I would, at that point, I would bring in your side of the, the conversation we've, we've kind of set aside, which was the, the alternative energy, um, something that has a lot more energy density. When we're, when we're converting and producing heat, uh, we're much better with something like propane, natural gas, even hydrogen is very, extremely uh, energy dense and very efficient at converting to heat. Mm -hmm. uh, even to cooling, there's, there's ways to, to create cool out of heat, as one of our shows actually talked about. But um, that one would be a tough one to watch. <laughs> I, I, I try. That, I mean, they, they don't recommend <laughs> yeah. watching that Don't one. try that at home, folks. Don't no. go back and look up our show on refrigeration and air conditioning. Uh, heat from cooling. <laughs> uh, cooling from heat. Um, we can do it. But I, I, at that point, I would recommend if we're building our, our, our house of the, the future future, then... And, and then the miniature step being natural gas until we get to that hydrogen house uh, that has a, a DC storage and a deep uh, hydrogen storage. Uh -huh. the, the hydrogen storage then is directly used for uh, heating our, okay. our range and our water heater and our dryer. Sure. Okay. So I will pull this back to hydrogen now on purpose because the hydrogen also plays another role. It's energy storage just like the batteries. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we just bought our new hydrogen fuel cell car. So, I've been told that a Toyota Mirai, which is kind of like a standard model passenger car, mm -hmm. can give you about three days worth of energy for the average house just in its system, batteries and hydrogen. <clears throat> so now, if we throw the car into the mix, which is also DC, on, on that hydrogen fuel cell side. And, yeah. And, okay. We throw that in the mix and say, okay, now we can connect your car to your house. You augment your battery storage with either hydrogen or onboard batteries. Um, now you have another backup system. And if you're making a lot of hydrogen, because you have extra solar panels and it's really sunny all the time where you live, sure. um, and you can store the hydrogen, now you can even put fuel in your car from stuff you're making off your solar roof and it's all carbon free. You bet. So if you really want to be looking at <clears throat> 2045 as a carbon free utility grid and you want to get really out there, let's look at pulling it all together. Let's look at pulling the cars and the house and the solar and the hydrogen and the batteries and inverters if needed, but and the even natural gas. If you can't bridge yourself all the way to hydrogen, you know, I mean to convert hydrogen cooktops and ovens and gas 
heater, water heaters and stuff. That's going to take money too to convert those. So mm -hmm. maybe until those become more ubiquitous, we're not going to do those yet. They'll just still be natural gas or whatever. Yeah. But you, what, I'm, what we're trying to do on the show is basically say, look, there's options out there. We, we don't have on the table now, mostly because of the code. You try to get this put in your house now, the inspector just go, eh, I don't know about this. No, you know? <laughs> it's not going to happen. No. So, but if we can draw from a clean slate, and that's what the show is about is the possibilities. Are we, are we in the realm of the real here? You, you are in the realm of possibility and, and technically acceptable to make your personal carbon footprint essentially zero, I think is what you're saying. Like that, that includes the energy you're producing and consuming <coughs> on your own property and the energy you're, you're consuming as you, as you travel. Just don't get on an airplane because that'll... that'll yeah. It'll eat away your carbon footprint. There's today. some Congresswomen that might There's, come off your case. Yeah. <laughs> their carbon don't have any cows in your backyard. <laughs> okay. I got plenty of chickens, and they're making up for it right good, now. Good. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, you can do that. Okay. It's possible. We can do that today. Great. Yep. Uh, I mean, and that's the whole, that was my whole idea when I was thinking about this show. Is that I don't think people really spend a lot of time thinking about their power grid in their house or whatever. I mean, they go home, they turn on the light, light comes on, they're happy. They turn on the refrigerator, open mm -hmm. the door, it's cold inside, they're happy. They don't really think about, hey, how could we do it better or, you know. And electricians are going, well, black wire, white wire, that's uh, all I care about. Don't make it more complicated than I need. Mm -hmm. But people like you and I who are getting creative and trying to do things a little different and trying to make the, the new future come true where we don't have carbon all over the place, you know, we think about this stuff. And it is possible. And I'm not an electrical engineer, and you are. And I'm a real creative sort of guy in a very weird kind of way. And when I bounce <laughs> stuff off of you that's electrical engineering, yeah. and you can give me a thumbs up, I'm really happy, even though you dampen it with hey, but the building code will never let you do it, Stan. But it's possible. So it gives us a starting point to talk to legislators, to talk to other people, to talk to companies that make refrigerators and things like that and make hydrogen fuel cell vehicles and things to really start thinking of how they could put the whole system together and make it so that we lower our utility costs, uh, increase our survivability in a natural disaster mm -hmm. by dispersing resources and having individual you know, grids instead of one big grid that's got a lot of fail points, um, uh, lower the carbon, if I didn't say that already, um, <clears throat> and hopefully make all of us a little smarter and more, uh, a little bit more attuned to what we're using for energy. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I t ask a lot of people is, when you look at your electric bill, how many kilowatt hours a day do you use? Because it's on there. Your average is on there. Yeah. Every month tells you how many days it's covered and what your average kilowatt use is. And most people have zero clue. And so, you I'm know, less than eight. I know if, exactly what that I, is. I, I know. So. <laughs> But that's my point. You and yes. I are probably the only two people that look at our bills with that kind of scrutiny. But that's what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. If everybody had the system in their house that they really, and it's not complicated, that they kind of understood that they were running themselves, it's no more complicated than your cell phone. I can guarantee you that. I mean, I, I hardly know how to use all those things on my cell phone. <laughs> we, could, we could do a house and a car mix that are really efficient and run off of solar, maybe some wind. Good mix of batteries, hydrogen. And that maybe even natural gas. Yeah. So it's all very doable. What what we're saying is in theory that if with the economies of scale, then this does have the the theoretical chance of being cheaper and safer. Um, safer is a, a loose term applied there, but uh, cheaper and a better way to do something mm -hmm. uh, given the technologies we have right now. Okay. So you heard it here first on Stan Energy Man. It's all doable. You guys that do NFPA and, and building codes, <laughs> just make it happen. We can start heading down the clean and green road, and we can call it the new Wilbins and Osterman clean green economy, and we'll go that way. You bet. And we're not running for office because we don't like politics. So thanks for joining us on Stan Energy Man this week, and we'll see you next week Friday where we'll have another interesting guest. Not as interesting as Ryan, but pretty interesting. And we'll, we'll see you back later on. Aloha.